Welcome back to Rising Tide, the Ocean Podcast. Half a century ago, we protested and rebelled against the lies of an unjust war and the brutality of institutional racism. Today, amidst the lies and blunders of a deadly pandemic, people are again confronting institutional racism, as represented by the police murder of George Floyd. Blue Frontier believes black lives matter, and that we can never achieve a sane approach to protecting our ocean planet until we defeat the insanity of oppression by protecting and respecting the rights of all people. It's not just that fighting racism is always the right thing to do, but also that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by pollution, rising seas, and climate change, and so often provide us leadership in the fight for a healthy blue planet. Polling has found that 69% of Hispanic or Latinx are, quote, alarmed or concerned, unquote, about climate change, along with 57% of African Americans and 49% of whites. To address the climate emergency, Blue Frontier has partnered with the Center for the Blue Economy to develop an Ocean Climate Action Plan, or Blue New Deal. Luckily, defending our environment is also documented concern of young people of every race, ethnicity, and party. For our seventh Rising Tide Ocean podcast, I'm speaking with my friend Danny Washington, a TV science host and ocean lover, about the challenges of the movement and the moment that we're living through today. Activist, artist, Miami-raised, Jamaican family roots. You mm -hmm. graduated in marine science from Rosenstiel at University of Miami, famous school there founder of Big Blue and You, which was to organize youth around ocean. And more recently, it was See Youth Rise Up. And it keeps going on. So you're, uh, you're, you've been doing online presentation, TV hosting. You hosted Exploration Nature Knows Best, which was syndicated on Fox. But that's the good Fox that gives us Simpsons. Not yeah, the Fox <laughs> Network, not Fox News. <laughs> no, not the right-wing propaganda. Um, and, and of course, you're also this tremendous water woman. You're a diver, a paddle boarder. You're, you know, the mocha mermaid. So um, that, that's a bit of it. But let's uh, start there and say that um, you've just moved to L.A. from Florida. Yeah, I mean, I've been here on and off for the last few years because in, you know, naturally being someone who wants to work in television and, and other entertainment industries, LA is a place to be. Um, so I've been living a bi-coastal life because my businesses and everything are based in Miami. Um, so I'm here in LA part-time, but because of COVID-19, I've been here full-time this year. So that's, it was my choice to stay on the West Coast instead of the East Coast. And it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we're in this crisis. Uh, Earth Day, I wrote a piece saying that, you know, when we had our first Earth Day in 1970, we had signs that said, Mother Nature, bats last, but who realized actual bats would be involved? Um, so <laughs> right. we destroy nature, we eat endangered wildlife, and it comes back to us in the forms of viral pandemics. Um, and then in the midst of this, we have the virus we've had for 400 years in this country of racism, where you have um, George Floyd's murder by the police that set off an explosion that's different, I think, in quality from the past. People now talk about it's, it's not a moment, it's a movement. <laughs> well, absolutely. It is a different time. Uh, this generation that's coming up is ready to see the proper changes happen in our society so that we can um, truly protect the planet. And, you know, it feels like a lot of uh, just a lot of fluff talk that has happened over the last couple of decades when it comes to um, changing the course of climate change and, and making sure that we protect species that are going extinct because we're seeing men and women who happen to be black being killed and shot dead in the street in broad daylight. Um, and yet we haven't figured out how to take care of each other. So how in the world are we going to take care of everything else on this planet? It's really a simple question. And with activism within the climate justice space, I think those leaders in particular, the young leaders are very clear. Like you said, they, they socialize in a different way. They socialize with everyone. They don't, they don't see these prejudices that have been, you know, wreaking havoc in, our American society for so long now, that's not a part of their repertoire. They're ready to expand. They're, they see the vision of the world way different than most previous generations do. And 
they're the one thing that is giving me hope right now. It's been tough to keep my my mind straight and focused on work. Um, of course, number one, in light of COVID-19, and number two, because of um, all of the racial injustice that's been just happening while we've been in quarantine. And that's like the hardest part to really grasp. It's like, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. People are inside for the most part, and yet cops still find a way to kill Black people in this country um, outright without punishment. The whole world had to come out and protest for these officers to be arrested. That is absolutely ridiculous. And we need a, a, a system that works for the people because for too long, unfortunately, the policing in America has not been for us. It's been against us. Part, part of the establishment rhetoric is the environmental movement is this white middle-class phenomenon. People of color don't care. The reality on the ground when you get down to Louisiana, these frontline communities, is low-income communities, communities of color are most impacted by pollution, by rising seas, by climate change. And so it's not, it's all connected. It's not just that you should always fight racism because it's the right thing to do, but it's more, it's more than just fighting racism. I think it's about eradicating racism. And like, what I would love to see is that the word racism is completely taken out of our, our consciousness. Honestly, like, I, I don't even want it to be that thing because I can't tell you how many times in the past where I've had folks tell me, you always make it about race. It's always about race. And it's like, <sighs> okay, <laughs> you're obviously not number one, empathizing with my personal experience. Number two, you're trying to silence me and make me feel as though my experience is invalid. And it's, it's, it's wrong. It's purely wrong. And when you look at frontline communities, like you said, in Louisiana or the first nations who have been dealing with this for however long, it's like, we're too busy trying to survive and to make ends meet day to day while pushing against these massive environmental injustices that are like looming over our communities constantly creating so much pain and suffering, whether it's cancer or, you know, uh, developmental issues in children or literally uh, dirty water, like in Flint, Michigan, where you can't even get an essential um, element that you need for your everyday life, clean water. It's a right, it's a human right. And it should be free for everyone across the world, but yet it's not. And people are still dealing with polluted water in Flint, Michigan. And so when you, when you look at the environmental you know, um, community and you see, okay, well, you, you and I, David, we've been to plenty of these summits and conferences and meetups and to discuss like on high level policy, policy change and all that, which is wonderful. And it needs to happen. But when you look around, how many people of color do you see in the room? For me, from my perspective, I'm one of the very few. And I feel privileged in that. I feel privileged that I can actually have the opportunity and the ability to attend these meetings and not have to fight like so many of my brothers and sisters are in their own communities. And so <clears throat> that gives me a very distinct sense of resolve um, in how I'm approaching my work. Uh, I am focused on breaking down doors, opening up opportunities, and trailblazing paths that I know younger people who are super passionate about the ocean, super passionate about the health of our beautiful planet. I want them to feel like they have an opportunity, that they have a chance, that they can step into this role whenever they're ready. Um, and so, so that's really my focus. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it's important that the environmental community, for those who can, find any and every opportunity to provide a, a way for young leaders and older generation leaders who are fighting in, on the, these frontline communities to bring them to the events, to give them some side, some more encouragement, um, information and tools in order to continue this, this, this battle that we're in. Cause that's really what it is. And it, we have to continue to work. We can't give up because there's too much at stake. Just one example, I live in Richmond, California. We're fighting, we're in the 10th year fighting to not privatize our public headlands. The last, intact public headlands and pristine yellowgrass beds in San Francisco Bay. And we know it, it's clear and our leadership's clear. If this were not a low income community of color, this would have been a public park 20 years ago. And, and instead it's, it's the last unprotected headland adjacent to a refinery. And they're trying to bring in a Southern California developer to, to, you know, put in high end housing that none in the community can afford. It's a story repeated all along our coastlines every day. And I, I don't want to over-romanticize the youth, but there is something different. And 
this has been a, a major focus of your youthful career, which is to to educate young people, girls, and bring them into uh, you know centers. And the wow. voice of youth is is unique because they don't you can't put them off as having any special interest. Their special interest is their future. Exactly. And I mean, they're the most informed generation in human history, if you think about it. They have the access, the level of access that they have to information at this point because of the internet, because of social media, it's it's astounding. And they're just constantly learning new things and they're able to pivot and they're able to adjust. And of course, every generation has its negative sides, you know, that people like to to label. But I think overall, Gen Z, they they they're just they're tired of seeing the old script play out. They don't want to see more um, patterns continue that are detrimental to human life and to um, all living things. And so they're going to, I think they're the ones who are really going to turn this ship around. Um, We just need to give them the chance. And as horrible as COVID-19 has been, and for all the families who have lost loved ones, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. I never thought in my lifetime that I would experience something like this. Um, but at the same time, it could, it, it could be, it could be that we may, you know, debate this in years to come, but it could be one of the, the best things that could have happened for humanity right now, um, because it brought this existential crisis of climate change uh, to the forefront of people's minds. It, it made us reconsider and think about the value of life and, and our way of life. Because for me, I know for me personally, I've been running for the last like five years, nonstop traveling. Um, working on these shows, you know, doing, working on different projects. And it just, it felt like I was, I, I was exhausted, to be honest. And so that first month of quarantine, it was me like reeling back and and slowing down and kind of matching my energy with my body and where I was like, (laughs) it was a really important time. And because I had a place to live, a safe place to be and all that, I was allowed to, to do this work internal work on myself. Um, but it, it also unveiled all of the, the injustices that are, you know, strewn throughout our economic system and socially here in America. And that's why I think the Black Lives Matter movement and these worldwide protests have erupted because people finally had a chance to stop and look and take a hard look at what our reality truly is. And not to brush over it, not to say, ah, I'm too busy. I can't deal with that. I got to, you know, I didn't know. This is this is a big speed bump that we had to stop and slow down on so we can pay attention to what's around us and fix the things that need to be fixed so we can actually move forward together. I mean, a lot of your work has always been um, working with youth, whether it's around bringing girls into marine science or just with Sea Youth Rise Up. And, and tell me some more about that. Tell us. Sure. So, you know, I was pretty dead set on becoming a marine scientist. When I was in college, I, I thought my path was going to be, uh, you know, a field researcher, someone who's going to publish papers and do what a traditional scientist does. I think I've always been fascinated with learning. And so that seemed like a perfect opportunity for me to be able to do that and to spend majority of my time in and around the ocean. Uh, after undergrad, I quickly realized that that was not my path. After you know going through several internships and volunteering opportunities, I had hands-on experience that showed me, hmm, I don't know, my natural skill sets and uh, the talents that I believed that I had didn't quite sync with the jobs that were apparently going to be available for me when I graduated. So that made me think about, okay, well, what are some other options? And you know, simultaneously, I realized that my own South Florida community, they they were so unaware of what was going on right on our, in our blue backyard. So like clueless, like, <laughs> and so that frustration uh, hit home for me and I understood, okay, well this, this looks like a communication gap. And once again, I was one of maybe three women of color in my entire marine science program in Miami, one of the most diverse cities in the U S it didn't make any sense. And so I was like, why is that? What, what, are those, what are the reasons? And so, of course, started doing my research and, um, you know, quickly realized, obviously, with the history of the transatlantic slave trade and understanding that Black Americans specifically have a very unique relationship to water because of the trauma that was uh, inflicted on them on the water. <laughs> you think about the millions of lives that were lost at sea. Um, 
the way in which water served as a barrier or a, a, how it imprisoned certain people, you know, to stay enslaved because they didn't know how to swim. And that legacy was passed on generation to generation all the way into the Jim Crow era where Blacks were not allowed to access public pools to learn how to swim and to just enjoy the water. And now you speed up to today and you're like, wow, yeah, there's still a whole new subset of children who were never taught how to swim. And we see that, you know, um, Black children are like 10 times li more likely to drown than their white counterparts. It's, it's a significant uh, difference. And it, for what? It's a basic life skill that we should have. And that's the first step in entering the ocean and wanting to be a part of, you know, and connecting with, with uh, the blue place that covers 75% of our planet. Uh, you have to learn how to swim. You have to know that you can handle yourself in that environment. So with that, I started a nonprofit and that was called Big Blue and You right out of college at 21. And the purpose of it was to connect young kids in my community with the ocean through art and science. So maybe not hitting this, the swimming lessons just yet, but at least giving them that, that open door to, to spark some curiosity about the ocean and doing it in a fun way where it's engaging and it allows you know, kids to just be introduced to the ocean in a really positive way, in a way that maybe their parents weren't able to do. Uh, so that, that was a whole journey in itself. And then at the same time, I started working Working in K through 12 of uh, video production. So I was working for a textbook company at one point for three years, making science videos for science textbooks with a whole team of people called Untamed Science. And then from there, naturally transitioned into uh, television and national television and was, and was hired in 2016 to host my very first show called Exploration Nature Knows Best, which is all about bio-inspired technology and design or biomimicry, uh, which is a Innovative a lot field. of fun. Biomimicry so, may sound serious. You you do no, it very it, nicely. It's so much fun. It's where we have seen the most brilliant minds around the world finally observing nature and looking at how nature has created these processes and 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 just brilliant designs that have obviously been evolving for billions of years. And so therefore it's damn near perfect. Um, and now humans are finally paying attention and saying, oh, maybe we should apply some of those concepts to what we're doing. <laughs> So it's that, it's that connection that I've always sought to create, to be the catalyst to help inspire um, someone's imagination, um, someone's love for nature, and then also give them an opportunity to connect. And uh, it, it's been so much fun. It's been a lot of work because I didn't know of anyone else besides, let's say, like Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, who or Jacques Cousteau, who kind of forged a similar path. And of course, I hadn't seen anyone who looked like me doing it. So I was like, okay, well, here's the opportunity. And so it's been a decade, over a decade now of um, and just, you know, labor of love, continuing to, to see myself in this, in this role. And I'm proud to be the first uh, African-American woman to host a science show. And you didn't leave Miami behind. There was 5,000 kids at one of these uh, <laughs> water festivals that, that uh, you recently were emceeing in, in Florida. Yeah, the festival that we host, uh, Big Blue and You host, is called Art by the Sea. And we invite local artists and local scientists to work side by side, um, creating these really fun hands-on activities. Um, and, and then we also inf infuse theater, drumming, dancing, paddleboarding, kayaking, all the activities happening all at once, like a sensory overload, but the kids love it because they can't get bored. There's always something for them to do uh, throughout the day. And the parents love it because they're like, my child is entertained and they're learning something at the same time and we're outside. So it was a win, win, win. <laughs> we have to move on climate immediately. You know, what we're doing today may just be triage. Um, we're saving what we can, but what, what do you see as the, uh, opportunities to link ocean and climate? Mm, I think there are a lot of opportunities to link ocean and climate. Um, I think, especially when, when you mention hurricanes, I mean, I'm a Florida native. I'm, I'm no stranger to massive storms. I lived through Hurricane Andrew in 1992 at six years old and saw the, the destruction that uh, happened in my, my community. And wow, that really woke me up to the fact that nature is always in control and that we will continue to see the repercussions of our behaviors um, in nature's response. And so I think the way that we connect ocean and climate is to, again, bring people to understand that their, their ripple effect of their daily lives truly matters. And I know it sounds a little bit rudimentary, 
and it's not trying to ring the same bell of like, oh, stop using single use plastic, which is something valid. But it's about people seeing the entire lifespan of what they're doing on a daily and how that is in turn feeding this this massive wave of of climate impact uh, that's on the way and that has already started. Like for them to feel it on their doorstep, I think sometimes might be the only way for people to truly wake up. But I think it's our job to connect folks now as much as we possibly can, humanly can, to show, yeah, this is this is a much bigger picture and you are definitely playing an integral role in this. So for example, the new documentary that just came out on Earth Day, The Story of Plastic, that documentary was one of the first documentaries I've seen about plastics that truly highlighted the lifeline and the lifespan of this material that we consider to be so miraculous and helpful. Um, but we see that every step along the way in the production of that material, people and frontline communities are being directly negatively impacted because we wanted to have a disposable fork with our takeout order. Like it doesn't make any sense and people need to take responsibility for those choices. And I, I, just, I just feel like that's, that's where the main, the heart of it all is. If people truly understood, understood that the interconnectedness of, of all of this, I think, I think people will make different, different decisions. And what we have to consider at this point is how are these oil companies, big oil companies looking into the end of life for their product, which we know up until this point, they have not, and they have not invested their massive profits into cleaning up the mess that they made. Instead, they've put it on the shoulders of consumers and making, and, and, and have tried to make us feel guilty for the fact that we're using these products. And then we're, we're expecting and hoping that our municipalities and our, and our governments will be able to handle the waste. But it's very clear that that's not the case. So how do we change that? How do we move away from those patterns? I think it's about, again, awareness and understanding what items you really don't need and, and COVID-19, you, you reconsider all of your, pay, your, your behaviors, your daily behaviors. Do you really need to use this? Do you really need to buy that? Is it super necessary? But we've also seen an uptick in single-use plastics because of the pandemic, because people are now afraid of germs and they want to be sanitary and they, they forget the, the power of just uh, warm water and soap. <laughs> You've got a new program you're working on, no? Or several. You're always working. I know you're doing <laughs> something with comedian. You're doing something uh, with science and CBS. What What are your latest yes. projects? Listen, I am Jamaican, and we are notorious for having five, six jobs. That's how we roll. <laughs> not to Not to bring in stereotypes, but no, I'm proud of my Jamaican heritage. And um, no, I was raised to to always be on my toes and to find opportunities and to to go for it and not to be scared. So. Um, I'm proud of that. But anyway, yes, I've been working on a couple of new projects. Uh, last, well, in 2018, I worked on a digital series for Facebook Watch, an insider called Science the Ish out of it, you know, the other, the other word. <laughs> and it was basically uh, answering questions that folks asked on their internet. It could, it was anything from, uh, does online dating work? Are chiropractors effective? and figuring out ways to, to answer these questions using the scientific method. And so it's a show that was targeting millennials um, and starting conversations about um, science and like, why is it good to understand the world around us? So that was super fun because I was co-hosting with a comedian named Christina Hutchinson uh, from New York and she was so awesome. We, you know, we, we riffed off of each other. I brought the science, she brought the fun and we like, we made it work. And then most recently, I've been working as a correspondent on a show called Mission Unstoppable on CBS, another nationally syndicated show. It's hosted by Miranda Cosgrove, who's um, a former actor on Disney. So a lot of kids grew up watching her on TV, which is cool. Um, and I love, I love that show because we're focused on uh, highlighting women who are working in STEM fields, science, tech, engineering, and math, and then sh talking more about their journey. So the voice of the show is so unique in that it's lighthearted, but it's chock full of information. It's giving girls and boys inspiration to see what types of careers they could pursue in STEM. And I think that's really where the pivot point is. When I talk about innovating our way out of all of these big problems that we're currently facing as a human race, it's the, it's the scientists who will figure out the solutions. And the more that we can encourage this next generation to not, not to lose their in, in, their inquisitive, inquisitive nature and to continue asking those questions. That's what a scientist is. A scientist is someone who is constantly looking around them, observing their world and asking the right questions and working to find the answer. And so I have always focused on how can I 
spark that curiosity for kids? How, what can I do? And I want to inspire them to think for themselves and to stop just believing what people tell them or feed them, but to actually look into it and figure it out. And like I mentioned, they're the most informed generation that we know of so far in humanity um, with their access to information. They can look up anything they want at any time. And so how can we leverage that? How can we raise up this generation to be ready and to and to just look at look at the possibilities and not be bogged down by the problems of the past? I always think that a lot of kids are formed, you know, that first time they're taken to the beach. You know, you build sandcastles, there's a future engineer, you go in the waves and get knocked over and look up sputtering and sort of that first sense that there's there's something bigger than yourself out there. And maybe you become the explorer, you become, you know, the Danny Washington. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's so many opportunities once kids are in, in a natural world. And as you say, you know, most of that natural world is salt water. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, and nature to me is freedom. When I'm out either in the ocean and I'm looking at the horizon or if I'm, you know, nestled in a beautiful forest with no other human in sight, that is where I feel the most liberated and um, connected to not only to the planet, but to other people as well, even though I don't even see them. It reminds me, like you said, of the, the bigger picture that I am part of this vast universe um, that works together. And if, if we choose, so like that's where we are right now, hum, humans are at that point where we have the choice to decide, are we gonna continue to work against this natural system that keeps us alive, this life support system that we have, or are we gonna work with it? And are we gonna help enhance and clean up and, and treat nature the way it deserves to be treated and to treat each other as well in that same regard um, and have respect for life? That's, that's what I hope, that's my hope for humanity at this point. Where do people uh, who are just hearing you for the first time, how do they get in touch with you and your projects? <laughs> well, you can always go to my website. I have my personal websites, dannywashington.com, and that's Danny with two N's and an I. Um, also, the, all the shows that I've worked on have their own websites. So you can just Google CBS Mission Unstoppable. You can watch episodes online there. Um, Exploration Nature Knows Best is on Amazon Prime. So you just search that whenever you go to Amazon. And, uh, and lots, of, lots of content on YouTube as well. So yes, please stay in touch I'm on all the social platforms. Just find me at Danny Washington. I'm out there. Write me a DM. I, I, I see you. I see you on beaches and uh, underwater. I get jealous. I feel like, especially with this, where I am with the COVID, I'm kind of getting dry rot. I haven't been diving or body surfing for months. Oh, well, wow. I've only gotten, I've only gotten to go in the ocean once in, in the last three months, which is on like, just not even close to what I'm nor normally doing. Any opportunity I get to go in the ocean, I'm there. But yeah, uh, we're, we're being so responsible right now. We are, we are, because we understand science. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Do you like cartoon sea creatures and want to save the ocean? Read 50 Ways to Save the Ocean and meet Claudia the Crab and Finley the Fish. Blue Frontier's David Helbarg and Sherman's Lagoon cartoonist Jim Toomey create some funny characters and fun actions you can take. Ask for 50 Ways to Save the Ocean at your local bookstore or order it online. Rising Tide, the Ocean Podcast is a production of Blue Frontier with the support of Studio Cape May. Music is by Ethan Kenvark. Tell your friends they can download us from Apple, Google, Spotify, or at bluefront.org. See you on the beach when it reopens. Remember, we can take the power in our well-scrubbed hands. Off in the salty ocean, off where the waves roll free. The sparkling water rises, then crashes to the sea. Out amongst the breakers, you'll have no need to fear. It's true, it's the blue frontier. Salty ocean, off to the blue frontier. Sparky, come here, buddy. Sparky, there you are. Good boy, Sparky. <laughs> <laughs>